first guests come to us from Notre Dame Track and Field. Since joining the staff in 2011 as an assistant, Sean Carlson has helped coach five NCAA champions and six NCAA All-Americans. Last season, Carlson also led the men's distance and middle distance squad to send a program best five student athletes to NCAA Outdoor Track and Field East Regionals. Middle distance standout Jacob Dumford is a 2013 and 2014 ACC Indoor Medley Relay Champion, 2015 All-ACC Second Team and ACC Academic Outdoor Track and Field Team Member, and 2016 Second Team Indoor All-ACC Mile and Distance Medley Relay Member. We look forward to hearing about the upcoming track and field season. Gentlemen, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you for having us. Yeah. This is this is me just sort of making myself feel better because when it, it's full of snow and the temperature's so cold, talking talking to people who are going to be running outside makes me feel better. <laughs> but you're running outside anyway, right? Most days. Some sometimes we feel soft. Over break, I put in a lot of treadmill miles. <laughs> And then we're 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 blessed here that we have the largest indoor track in the country. So yeah, the uh, Ed Loftus. Yeah, so we 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 mix it up a little bit and are able to get in there. But 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 not to inflict too much pain on you here. But how do you manage? So you want to do an outdoor run today, right? And 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 you're deciding the distance and 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 where we'll go. How do you figure out where to run on a day where there's a lot of snow around South yeah, Bend? Yeah, the usually our best bet is around campus actually because we do a really good job of uh, plowing and salting and putting de-icer down uh, within the campus confines but sometimes uh, when we go off campus it can be a little bit more challenging uh, when, when we get into that negative temperatures and where the snow doesn't melt. I have great admiration for uh, watching watching you and your teammates um, both male and female out there on, on some some pretty cold days getting it yeah. done but it's uh, it's part of it's part of the commitment right? Yeah sure enough. Now you're a grad student now right? Yeah. What do you what do you what, what are you studying? So I uh, graduated in May with my uh, bachelor's in computer science, and then uh, we have a one-year master's in computer science that I'm doing this year. Oh, great. You enjoying it? Yeah. Well, it, it's been tough, but, yeah, it's been real good. Is it any easier or harder to balance the academic load as a grad student with your commitment to track and field? Um, I would say for my program specifically, um, it – shouldn't have been any harder but I got myself into a couple just brutal classes in the fall and that was really hard to hard to manage um but I was able to get by just fine and and I think that my classes this spring are going to be a lot easier I kind of front loaded the the year so that once we got into track season it'd be pretty smooth sailing coach give me a scouting report on Jacob yeah so one of the most exciting things you know right now is he just broke the school record in the thousand and the previous school record holder, former national champion, Jeremy Ray, held that. Um, so there, there should be some promising things uh, coming uh, this indoors and outdoor season. Uh, that, that definitely is not a easy easy record to take down. So we're, we're really excited about uh, seeing where he can go with that. Now you're 800 mile, right? Mm -hmm. those, 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 which do you prefer? Uh, in college, I've, I've definitely had more success over like the mile and 1500 distance. Have you ever done either high school or here the longer distances? Yeah, well, I, I ran four years of cross country. Uh, luckily, I well, I say luckily. Luckily, I got my four years of eligibility out of out of the way in cross country when uh, I was an undergrad. So then this year, uh, it was really um, a whole new thing for me coming back in the fall and not racing all fall because every other year I'd had had to gear up for eight k's and ten k's over grass, which is just a a whole different beast yeah. than the mile and so I think that like that was a huge uh part of the reason I was able to break that record was because I was uh I was just training specifically for the types of distances that I race on the track all fall what are your personal goals for the year oh man personal goals for the year um I mean obviously that sub four minute barrier has been it's been a goal for probably three years now and uh I think that it's it's uh, really pretty attainable, and so we're gonna take a couple shots at it during indoor, and then just kind of see what happens. Uh, I'd also like to take another second or two seconds off my 800 uh, best and run 147 or 148. That would be really awesome. And then probably like the primary goal of the the team for the the indoor season would be to 
take a, a distance medley relay to the national meet. Coach, what what about team goals for the year? Yeah, yeah. Our uh, our men's team is is really exciting right now because it's kind of up and coming, uh, especially in the in the men's distance. Um, you know, we brought in a really good class last year. We've got a couple of graduate students returning, and then even. Uh, when you look at uh, our recruiting class coming in next year, we have the number one recruiting class in the country on the men's distance side. So uh, we're, we're excited to just keep growing the program uh, and, and keep heading in the right direction. What has the move to the ACC meant uh, competitively for the men's program? Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, it's a step up uh, athletically. Uh, there, there's no doubt about it. When there's 16 schools, uh, all, you know, power five, uh, it's going to be tough. Um, the The biggest change has been when we were in the Big East, there was more middle distance events scored mm-hmm. at the conference meet, and there's a little bit less. So that um, throws off the distribution of points uh, to compete for a, a conference title. Um, and so there's a little bit less middle distance points for us to go grab uh, like we were able to in the Big East. I don't want to get too technical here, yeah. but what, what's the event? Is it, so, is it how many they score or the events they run that yeah, produce the difference? the events they run. So in the Big East, they ran the 4x8 and the K in addition to the 800 and the mile. And so they've uh, basically eliminated two events in the middle distances. Well, we got a lobby for that, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. especially the, the, the thoroughbred. You know, that's kind of one of our biggest uh, areas. Yeah, yeah, I'd absolutely. be winning some more races <laughs> if we still <laughs> those. Exactly. have some more conference medals. Um one of the one of the changes that this year is ushered in is a new home uh, for, for for the program yeah. in the Harris Family Track and Field uh, Facility. I'd like both your perspectives on on the facility and 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 how it benefits the program. Uh, Jake has probably a really good perspective on it because he's seen previous what we what we had, and uh, and and he's gotten to transition to this and see kind of how the freshmen react to it, and then how the upperclassmen react to it. Yeah, I mean. Um it's been a really interesting change. If for, I think we were pretty skeptical the first like month or two of school because there's some things uh, that we just like missed about our old locker room because it had all the character of like an old locker room and the big open group showers and all of that stuff. And <laughs> and uh, but now like the the facility's awesome. Like the team room has been stocked with just tons of food. So like you get done with a lift or you get done with a run and you just go in there and you you have the fuel that you need and the locker room is really nice it's it's like a really cool space um it's a little bit more walking from uh some of the other buildings that we're in a lot of times but like it's it's nice to have our own space that that is like just for us and we've been able to we've been able to use it um for like some team dinners and things that we like didn't really have a space for before so it's been It's been great. And then especially when the weather is warmer, it's been awesome because we'll all come back from a run and we'll, uh, we're just right next to the track. We can walk from our locker room out onto the track in 10 seconds. And so it was, it during the early parts of cross country season was a lot of extra, just like rolling out, stretching all of those extra recovery things. So it's been, it's been a good move. It's multifaceted, you know, obviously athletically it's going to help us, but you know, there's room in there for kids to study, you know, in between classes or in between practice. And then, you know, even from a recruiting standpoint, when a recruit walks into that building, their jaw drops. You know, it's one of the nicest facilities in the country, and uh, we're really excited to have it. Yeah, that's great. And if we're going to ask students to walk a little further, it ought to be track and field, yeah. people, right? Oh, <laughs> they, I guess so. They're, they're used to it. Um, I, I love asking our, our, our athlete guests who come on the show, and I want to ask you, why Notre Dame? How did you wind up here? a good question um i well like i'm sure a lot of the other athletes here uh athletics like quickly narrowed down my uh choices of schools so i i like narrowed it down to probably the five or six schools that i was going to visit uh go on like athletic visits and then i started visiting schools and this was actually the first visit i went on and i just really loved the guys on the team i really got along with them super well and then the overall just experience of the campus and and the academics and just there's I don't know there's just like something about this place and I just I thought that it was somewhere that um, I thought it was somewhere that I could for sure be successful athletically and then I thought that athletics aside it was somewhere that was going to set me up great just for the rest of my life. Um, after you enjoy what I know will be a very successful season, what's next for you? 
Oh, that's that's really tough um, because I I truly don't know what the next step is. Um, I'm going to pursue like a professional or semi-professional track career next year, but that can look a lot of different things. It's probably going to mean joining a, uh, a group where maybe I get some gear or some housing paid for, but like you really don't earn a salary unless you're like really really good. So the idea would be to join one of these groups, try to run. Um, competing uh, hopefully to qualify for like uh, USA like Olympic trials and things like that and then on the side I'll probably do some like hopefully some software development right well we love it when you can uh, when you can find a way to do both right yeah you continue continue your passion athletically but uh, hopefully we we'll put you in a place where uh, you can also support yourself doing yeah. that um, it sounds like you you've definitely positioned yourself for that Coach, you, you mentioned earlier um, the class you recently signed. Tell us a little bit about that because I know they've had a great year. Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, not too long ago, the Foot Locker National Championships, which is the high school cross-country national championship, uh, we have the guy who won it, uh, who's actually the fourth Notre Dame uh, kid in the past seven years to have won it, wow. uh, which we're the only school in the country that has that. Um, so we went one, three, and 12. There's no other school in the country that had two in the top 15 and we had three in the top 12. Uh, so we're, we're going to be uh, pretty loaded up for the next couple of years. We're, we're really excited about that. We should have scored that as a team meet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, actually two of them will be going this weekend to represent uh, Team USA in Edinburgh with a uh, former student athlete, Molly Seidel. Um, so, yeah, it's it's the Irish are representing the U.S. very well in, in men's and women's distance running right now. Well, and of course, that's always been a strength of the program, in a sense, as you mentioned earlier. And on the women's side, of course, a lot of success too. Uh, how do you how do you go about deciding how to allocate your resources, if you will, in building a track team yeah, and, and at team the college around. level? Because you've got field events, you've got sprinters. How do you how do you figure that out? Yeah, well, that's my boss's job. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I think uh, here at Notre Dame. Uh, it's it's about having well-rounded everything you know and that includes a you know a track team too so obviously we've we've had a lot of success in men's women's distance but uh, i don't think that is neglecting the other events and and we've done very well in head school records and all americans uh, every year since i've been here in 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 every event across the track and uh, that's kind of the exciting part is you know it's uh, it's a team. There's the men's distance, the women's distance, the men's throws, the women's throws, so on and so forth. So there's little teams within a, a larger team, yeah. uh, and and it's it's exciting environment. Well, you've helped make it exciting. Thanks for all you've done, Jacob. We're we're gonna look forward to that sub four minute mile. We're counting on it, and uh, and all the all the success that's ahead for you to both of you. Thanks a lot for uh, joining us, and we'll be back in a minute. Billy is sold out tonight. The anticipation is building. We're set for the opening tip, and we are underway here in Notre Dame. Oh, tip, it goes to Young, her jumper goes. Jackie Young is going to be a star. One word that sums up this Notre Dame team pretty well, and that is dominant. Marina Mabry fires a three. Mabry for the triple. Catherine Westfeld up over to Raymond Ann. That's Catherine Westfeld. Enrique Ogumbawali. Enrique fires up the three. Got it. Outstanding. If you're not here, you're missing it. Our next guest is Senior Associate AD of Compliance, Policy Management, and Legal Affairs, Jill Bonensteiner. Jill has also served as the Sport Administrator of second-ranked Notre Dame women's basketball. In addition to that, she is on an NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Championship Sport Committee, becoming the first Notre Dame representative to serve on the 10-person group. We are thrilled to have Jill join the show during a very busy spring semester for women's basketball. Jill, thanks for being here. We're going to start on the basketball side of things. Um, it's my favorite side of things. Absolutely. Second-ranked women's basketball team. I, I understand that you're responsible for all health issues for <laughs> exactly. associated with the team. That's right. And, and uh, I'm not sure I'd be here today if that were the case, if anyone was solely responsible for those. Four ACL yeah. tears in some version of eight months, nine months, whatever it is. Have you has anybody encountered a run like that? It's it's phenomenal. I mean, I, I not that I know of with the four. I mean, it's just uh, it's been a really tough stretch. 
but yet the team has done so well uh, responding to it. Uh, let me start with some of the simple logistics. How do you practice with seven scholarship players? Thank goodness for male practice player squad, but that gets tough over break, right? right. Um, so the you know you're not allowed under NCAA rules to give expenses to male practice players, and with Notre Dame being a national university, none of them live here. So I would say, and of course our, our break is a month, so I would say that was a month of a lot of Coach Ivy getting a lot of reps at the point guard <laughs> position. I, I tried to explain to the NCA that none of our coaches could possibly jump in and play, <laughs> but that, that, that was a loser. So. Not a bad point guard to pull off your bench. <laughs> Not a bad uh, one. With, 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 with Coach Ivy. Well, the team has responded so phenomenally well to this. Um, other than being great kids who are skilled basketball players, how to what do you attribute that success? You know, we had such a phenomenal opportunity in September to watch Muffet get uh, inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, and these are the times when you remember just how good she is at yeah. at the intangibles, but also the X's and O's. I mean, I think I've mentioned uh, to you, and you and I have talked about this, she's a master at putting the pieces together, and this becomes a puzzle where you got to figure out how to make post players guards and how to how to really fit the puzzle pieces together, reinvent your offense, find different ways for different people to score who might not have had or needed that opportunity. So a, as difficult a stretch of this has been, it's been really fun to watch her do just exactly what she's so good at. Yeah, well, she has done it uh, superbly well, assisted by you and the, and the coaches. Let's talk for a minute about what the responsibility of a sport administrator are? So really to help our coaches focus on winning conference and national championships, let them do the coaching and what can we clear out of their way, um, serving as sort of a general manager, helping with budget, um, you know, helping with if they need a new assistant coach because one gets a different opportunity, helping them with the hire and other personnel matters. Um, you know, I really see myself as, as support for coach. Of Sometimes they need a sounding board, as she has, uh, with this string of injuries, just being there to listen. Um, and then, you know, really important, and I, and I hope I've been able to do this effectively, is becoming a part of the national landscape. And, and Coach McGraw is just fantastic at being on committees and, and working through legislation that impacts women's basketball. But, you know, my ability to serve, and I'm so lucky and, and honored to be able to serve the NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Committee, means I'm as tapped in as anyone in the country in our sport. So whether it's playing rule changes or format to the championship changes or, you know, even just through that, getting to know all the broadcast talent and all those connections that I've been able to make. And, you know, I thank you for encouraging all of our sport administrators to become part of that national landscape in whatever sport they oversee. Yeah, I, I, that, that is where I wanted to go next. You're, you're now a veteran. You've got a year under your belt of That's right. picking the teams for the national tournament and going through the whole selection process what'd you learn from that well you know I was really helped me for one able to educate our ACC counterparts and what are we looking for right I mean I don't talk specific teams with them but I'm able to really understand and talk through the process and that uh, gave me the opportunity to lead the ACC women's basketball through a strategic planning effort in this past year to, to really say what are our goals and how can we get there whether it's through scheduling um, I have a really pretty good understanding now of what a non-conference schedule should look like depending on what your NCAA goals are do you want to be in the tournament do you want to host um, you know and and, and your and your non-conference schedule plays a lot into that so so it's helped me in such a myriad of ways to just really even f further understand the landscape of women's women's basketball and and have that voice when there are decisions like should we change the regional format you know the sweet 16 format uh, Muffet and I are able to put our heads together and then I'm on that committee making and recommending such decisions so it's it's been just a um, phenomenal opportunity for me I've learned to be much smarter in the way I watch games so I was trying to catch everything live last year well there are some teams that are going to start out 4-0 and, <laughs> and not be heard of when it comes so I'm waiting a little bit and then going back as teams start to peak um, and watching dozens of their games as I start to get a little better picture of who's probably going to be, you know, we're watching the automatic qualifiers for seeding purposes. We're looking at at-large teams from each conference. And so I think I've got a lot more efficient in my second year on the committee. Does, does the committee uh, divide its responsibilities?
responsibility so you focus on a, a conference or a com com conferences? That's exactly right. So there's 32 conferences in Division One that play basketball, and there's 10 of us on the committee. So the way that math works out, I serve as primary on three conferences, and I'm supposed to know those conferences cold. Um, and and one of those three is a, is a conference likely to get multiple bids. So that's one we may go, you know, five, six, seven, eight deep. And then I'm secondary on four conferences. So I'm also um, really my, my responsibilities are pretty similar about the only difference on the secondaries. I don't lead the monthly calls with that group. But um, so that's really seven conferences. And, and then I'll watch all the other big games. Right. So even if, you know, Texas and Florida State aren't in one of my conferences, of course, I'll watch that game. Um, you mentioned that you've become a little more efficient in how you approach it, but I know how, how earnestly you approach this responsibility. How many games would you guess you watched last year? 311. Oh, it's more than a guess. We had to we track them, uh -huh. and just if there's any, we turn them into the NCAA. If there's any question on, oh, gosh, oh, did anyone watch us play this year? We can say, actually... You know, 32 of your games were seen by X number of committee members. So I have a spreadsheet. Every time I watch a game, I plug it in. I put comments. Um, I might put in there, you know, starting point guard was out. Uh, foul trouble for their superstar in the second half, you know, whatever it might be that will trigger my memory when we come to discussing those teams. So I'm pretty, uh, in addition to having to turn them in, I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty exhaustive in my approach to note-taking. Yeah, I've, I've, I know that from our working relationship. Um, so you have a unique vantage point. You're inside one of the top programs in the country. You, you have the perspective on the whole country through the committee. What's the state of the game? Where, where, where is the women's game right now? I'm excited about the state of the game. I mean, I you know, I think in some ways it's seen as having really significant growing competition from volleyball and softball. When you talk about college women's sports, I think it's a good thing to have three sports and hopefully right. many, many more that, I mean, you look at ESPN's coverage of softball last year, just knocked it out of the park. Volleyball championship this year was just an absolute spectacle and a, a feel good. Um, and that's a good thing. It doesn't mean basketball's in a bad place. It means we've got more exposure for, for women's sports. And, you know, I'm trying to say, let's do things like go to volleyball and softball. What can we learn? Um, you know, one the, the, the one thing when I when I talk about what's one thing I'd really like to improve in women's basketball, um, and, and I'm focusing right now on the tournament, it's the regional. So you have, you know, you host first and second round sites. It's a great atmosphere at most schools where you're hosting. And then when you make it to the Sweet 16, playing for an opportunity to get to the pinnacle, the final four, there's crowds of 1,800 in 17,000 seat arenas. Yeah. That's not a good, it, it's all about the student athlete experience. That's not a good experience for them. It doesn't look good on TV. Um, so we're really looking at that regional model. There are a lot of people who are putting our heads together thinking, what, what can we do? Is it smaller arenas? Is it uh, one big super regional? Um, you know, what, what? So that's one of the things, just one example of the kind of issues we're talking through. You know, our audience is probably exhausted just contemplating watching 311 games and, and doing all that work. But that's only and being the sport administrator. But as if you didn't have enough to do. You've played a big role in a national organization, Lead One. Talk a little bit about that organization and what your role has been with it. Well, I have to remember there's an audience here because you're pretty familiar with it, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so when, when you were became chair of D1A and led it through a, a phenomenal just sort of rebranding and, and rejuvenation, it became Lead One. And uh, Tom McMillan, fabulous uh, hire as the CEO and president of Lead One. Tom's got a great background, Rhodes Scholar, Maryland basketball player, MBA, uh, congressman, and, and is a great leader. So when Tom took over that organization in 2015. Um, you were gracious enough to loan me out and kind of help Tom get his feet feet under him and, and help him just sort of focus in and as appropriate, whether it was education of athletic directors on an upcoming issue or advocating for some changes to legislation or pending legislation. Um, got a really neat opportunity to start working with Tom, um, you know, with, with that rejuvenation to become a, a group that um, the 130 athletic directors that it represents from the football bowl subdivision schools can really have a group that's focused on professional development, education, and advocacy. And so we took that a step further this spring when I moved out to Washington, D.C. for a couple weeks, a couple months, and got to work sort of hand-in-hand -hand with Tom and, and getting our arms around um, the issues of the day. So I've had some really positive developments, I think, on some of the issues that we've been working on. 
Well, and you're probably most closely identified in all that with the impact you had on the national legislation regarding time management for student athletes. We're now a, a full year into that, a series of regulations which help make sure, A, that there's equity among the experience of athletes, but also that they have time to be students. Um, as someone who played such a major role in that, what, what's your perspective? How's it working? So each of our 26 sports has a time management guru or more than one, depending on the sport. And so there are about 85 student athletes who are really, really engaged in this. And in a recent survey, I think upwards of 87% of them said it has improved their quality of life. Um, to me, that's a good thing. And it's, it's again, it's, it's predictability. It's really not changing the amount of time they're doing things, but it's, it's allowing them to see a schedule two weeks or a month in advance. Then you can say, um, which has forced us to get our A game together, right? We got to right. help the coaches figure out who's practicing where and get facility schedules and, and those sort of things out. I think there are, you know, it's really helped everybody realize the importance of efficiency and predictability. So now a student athlete can look a month in advance and say, okay, I see when I can have my group project meeting. I see when I can meet with my professor and, and do those things, or I see when I can get out of here for a weekend um, and go and visit a friend at IU or enjoy um, some family time. So, um, so what what I'm hearing from the student athletes is really what we care about. This is about them and for them, and and so far it's been really positive. And as you say, I mean, it, um, part of it was sort of setting some rules and regulations, days off uh, during the course of the year and in a week, and some time limitations on when you could and couldn't practice. But the hallmarks of this have been knowing what the schedule is and having some process for changing it because what 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 our students kept telling us over and over again is just <laughs> tell me what it is and stick with it right yep that's exactly right and of course there are you know extenuating circumstances that occur but you know and it, uh, generally speaking they, they ought to know when they have commitments that are athletically related and that certainly frees them up um, like I said it wasn't so much a time thing as it was an advance notice of when I can get engaged in academically and otherwise so um, from that perspective I think it's been great um, you know each student athlete gets 21 additional days fully off which you know I, I think sometimes our coaches and our student athletes were worried about that we want to get better we want to practice hasn't been a problem we, yeah. we have found that mo most of our coaches were giving that time off anyway but again now they know when those days are going to be which really helps them you and i are headed to the ncaa convention soon um what's on the agenda there feels like a lighter year than it has been in a couple of recent meetings. It feels like a lighter year, and I think in part we were so two feet in on time management for such, I think people were a little bit out of energy and wanting to be able to implement. I mean, it's the same people who work on legislation then have to implement it, and so it's hard to keep that energy up getting a whole new cycle. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot. I wouldn't say that the legislation coming out of this is earth shattering, but it's been a great conversation over the past year regarding student athlete medical care and insurance. Um, and it's really, we've done an exhaustive uh, really look at the, this is autonomy legislation. So the 65 schools who make up the five autonomy conferences and what's come out of that is really um, we've got some great coverage. We've got great medical care for our student athletes. We have some great insurance coverage. We probably don't educate or tell our story, um, educate student athletes and their families and tell our story nationally. Um, so, you know, sometimes the general public thinks and has the perception that, you know, student athletes are, are, are not getting what they should be. Should they be compensated? You know, here at Notre Dame, we have a, a student athlete medical insurance plan that pays out 10 years after injury. It's phenomenal. It's, it's great coverage. It's great peace of mind for our student athletes and our families. And, and again, what I've learned over the past year is we've got to tell our story internally and externally. Well, you do that for Notre Dame as effectively as anyone, and, and thank you for the many ways in which you serve this university, our student-athletes. Uh, good luck with the next 311 games that, uh, that, that you watch, and I, I hope uh, to see you in both capacities at the Final Four this year as the sport administrator and as a member of the committee. Nothing would make me happier. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being with us. Yep. We'll be back in a minute. He scores! Score, drops it off to Evans. Fire. 
guest on today's show is Notre Dame men's tennis head coach and former Notre Dame tennis three-time All-American, Ryan Satchery. Since joining the staff in 2016, Notre Dame men's tennis has had 10 NCAA championship appearances, three NCAA single championship appearances, three NCAA doubles appearances, and in 2013, he led the team to the ACC championship semifinals. We can't wait to hear more about Satchery's accolades and about this year's team as they prepare for their first match of 2018. Coach, or Satch as they call you, thanks for being with us. They do. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, you were standing uh, on the other side of the cameras when uh, we were talking to Jill, um, and I, I want to get a coach perspective on the first year with the time management system. How has it been from your perspective? You know, for us, in our sport in particular here at Notre Dame, we don't face maybe the facility disadvantages that some other f programs do where they're balancing uh, multiple teams using the same facility. So for us, what we do hasn't really been affected. I, I think the, the really big positive to coaches, certainly the student athletes and everybody is, as Jill alluded to, the organization on the front end of things is, is probably a little bit more diligent and uh, more planned out ahead of time. And so I, I think from just like I said, a, a, an efficiency of schedule for our student athletes. It's been fantastic, but in terms of affecting the day to day, what we do, how we train, how we prepare, uh, hasn't really changed anything. You have um, a somewhat unique perspective of having played here and and now leading the program here. How does how does a how has time produced changes? But how does your perspective change from being an athlete in the program and leading it? Yeah, no, it's it's been uh, it's been a heck of a ride, and and it certainly is different on the other side of the desk as as a head coach, uh, even as an assistant coach from from being a student athlete. There's so many things that go into uh, running a program that I think when you're a student athlete and you're consumed with your own day to day responsibilities and activities, that you have no idea. You know uh, whether it's logistical planning, scheduling, et cetera. Um, but I also have such a tremendous appreciation for what our student athletes do and how they live their lives. I mean, the, the, the stresses that they have and, and the opportunities that they take on both academically as well as in tennis and then, and then socially as well. Um, when you're going through it, uh, it just seems like normal life when you, when you're on the other side of the desk and, and you are observing what our guys and, and all the student athletes here at Notre Dame are, 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 are doing. It's, it's remarkable um, just to see them grow, watch them grow, watch them conquer uh, the challenges that they face, and, and um, it's really, really a, a special thing to see them mature that you don't maybe feel or, or get when you're going through it as much. When you're evalu evaluating prospective uh, student-athletes, given what you've just said, uh, beyond the tennis dynamic, there must be a lot of emphasis on fit, I mean, how they're, how they're going to do here. Yeah, and, and, and not just saying this, but you do a tremendous job of always reminding us coaches that it is about the fit being here at, at Notre Dame. And certainly one of the things that I look for um, and, and try to flush out as much as I possibly can is the maturity of the kid and, and how much he really does want to have that, that dual responsibility at the highest level of competing in the classroom against some of the brightest minds and greatest students in the, in the, in the world, really, but certainly the country. And, and at the same time, uh, you know, playing tennis in, in the, the best tennis conference in the country and, and, and trying to elevate our program to, to one that's, that's a national champion. And so, you know, finding the right fit, uh, the kid that can, can do athletically what we want him to do and, and, and ultimately help take our program forward, uh, but at the same time balance everything that comes with being a Notre Dame student, uh, it's pretty unique. And there's a lot of really, really talented, good kids um, that maybe don't fit that, that mold that we're looking for. Um, so it, it really is a, a vital thing that we, we flush out early in the process. You mentioned participating in the best tennis conference in the country. What, uh, several years in now, what's, what's been the impact of that? It's been fantastic for recruiting. I think more importantly, fantastic for the development of our, of our student athletes. Um, again, talking about challenges, talking about obstacles and, and overcoming them, um, you know that's that's what growth is all about that's what we try to do as educators here and and um you know the acc finished one two and three nationally last year in in tennis and so you know when when you're playing that type of schedule um you know that you have to be on you have to be at your a game 
uh, every single every single match, and, and certainly in our conference and out of conference as well. But um, again, I think what the impact on our program has been has been really really positive um, from a, a a recruiting perspective, like I said. But more importantly, once the kids get here their development as, as athletes certainly, but even as people too, I think has really grown because, you know, they know that they can't be anything less than their best. Um, students are about done with break and you'll be, you'll be about the tennis season. What does the structure of the season look like as you get into it now? Yeah, well, we're, we're right in the middle of, of our preseason camp, so to speak. Our, our first match is uh, at home. Friday, January 19th at 5 p.m. And, and once that kind of goes, we, we I think we have one off weekend until the end of May. Um, and so the structure is that it's consistency, uh, you know, throughout the course of the second semester here. Um, and, and you know, like all sports, we play a non-conference schedule early in the year and then head into ACC play around spring break time around mid-March. Um, and just philosophically, I've always believed in scheduling the best teams that we can possibly play. And, and you know, we're fortunate that there's some strong Big Ten teams that are, are driving distance for us to play out of conference and, and get great, great competition early in the year. And then, as I talked about, the strength of the ACC is, is incredible. And, and so from, you know, late January through late May, our guys are, are tested and challenged every single weekend. And um, that leads to tremendous focus every day in practice. And, and uh, while on, on one hand it can be tiring and exhausting, on the other hand is every every match we play and, and every day preparing for that's an opportunity. And, and our guys have done a really good job of, of getting themselves ready throughout the off season here, and, and we're ready to go. How do you build the lineup? How, what's, what, what's your approach to deciding where to put your emphasis and who plays where? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, to an extent, it, it determines itself. Um, clearly at the top of the lineup, you know, and this is what you want is we, we have a, a, a national stud that's going to play number one for us. And so making that determination is pretty easy. Um, and, and then after that, you know, we have a lot of guys. We return seven players that throughout their careers have, have won, played in and won in uh, big ACC conference matches. And we have one of the best freshman classes in the country too. So we have a lot of depth, a lot of talent to choose from. Um, you know, I, I, some of it's game style. Some of it is is weaponry and, and high end when, when a guy's playing his best. You know, maybe he's he's got bigger weapons than another player on the team that day in and day out are fairly even. You, you want to play – the guy with the higher upside usually a little bit higher in the lineup um and 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 again typically play your more consistent players that you know what to expect day in and day out um maybe don't quite have that upside to reach but but are going to be there for you every single day those guys are generally the ones that you have down low you, you, you somewhat alluded to it in that answer but the story of this team's youth i mean you got you you not only have some young players that you'll be relying on you've got a great class and you've got a great class coming in behind it absolutely no we we um our first our freshman and sophomore classes year classes are are the majority of our team in terms of numbers and we could play a, a dual match tomorrow of just uh, with a lineup of just freshmen and sophomores and we'd be we'd be great we'd be fine um not saying that that's what is ultimately going to flush out that way, but um, we have really, really high-end players in our younger classes. And, you know, with that is going to be some, some up and ups and downs, some inconsistency. We know that. Uh, we're prepared for that. But I, I really do believe it's a group that as they continue to grow together and get the exposure to the schedule that we play and, and, and all that comes with being a student athlete here at Notre Dame, I think certainly this year we can be very successful. And, and as the years go on, we have a chance to, to really have some high-end results. Where, where will the leadership come from among this, the members of this team? Yeah, we have, uh, our, our, we have two co-captains. Um, one is a senior named Brendan Kempen, who has been a consistent double starter for us for the last year or so. Um, great kid, uh, natural leader. Uh, he'll do, he just brings a consistency every single day. Uh, the younger guys really look up to him. He's, he's a mentor to them. Great person, great role model. Um, and again, the guy that's just, the same guy every single day and that's that's really important in leadership um and then our other other captain is a is a junior academically technically a a sophomore eligibility wise named alex lebedev and he he's the one that'll play number one for us in the lineup and he's he's our competitive leader um i've i don't think i've 
coach the player certainly and, and and you can make an argument no player in the country has improved as much as he has in those last two years um he he's a phenomenal phenomenal worker i think as, as coaches you always talk to your players no matter what sport no matter what level uh, to not take a rep off not take a day off have a focus have an intentionality to everything that you do and and you know to varying degrees athletes find themselves on on, on a scale I, alex is at the top of that scale and he, he he literally does not take a rep off in practice his work volume the engine that he has to 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 push himself in everything that he does he's a phenomenal student as well uh is honestly as high as I've, I've ever seen and and he's made himself into one of the nationally elite players in, in our sport and and like I said, he'll play at the top of our lineup, and, and he's the other captain that we have on our team. That's exciting. I, I'm, I'm not sure there's anyone among our head coaches who, who, who engages with the other coaches from other sports more effectively than you do or more frequently than you do. What do you gain from that? Well, they would call it an annoyance. But, uh, <laughs> no, look, I, 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 I firmly believe in the philosophy that you're either getting better or you're getting worse. There's no maintaining, and, and I – try to learn from from we have phenomenal coaches here at Notre Dame and and you know Muffin McGraw Jeff Jackson Mike Bray Kevin Corrigan coach Kelly Bobby Clark who who recently retired I mean and, and others I'm leaving out phenomenal phenomenal coaches and and um, I've become a better man and a better coach just by being around them and engaging them and as, as long as they'll take my questions I'm going to keep delivering them well, um, I don't know how much of it is that, but something's leading to the success. <laughs> we we appreciate everything you do for this university and especially for, for our students who are members of the tennis program. I know it's going to be an exciting year and best wishes. It will. Jack, thanks so much for having me. Great to have you on. Uh, we'll be back in a minute. <laughs>